will say good, good afternoon to everyone again. Already been blessed by the testimony of the saints and uh, how God is working in our lives personally, providentially. I mean, it's nothing like uh, being meeting and gathering with the saints and finding out and being blessed by them as God is blessing them and we can share wonderful, wonderful times together. And so uh, let's look to him and ask him to do what he's already done and continues to do. Let us bless our time together. Let us pray. Almighty God, it is with great joy and anticipation what you have done and what you shall do. We unite our hearts together to say thank you. Thank you for assembling us here today together. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will speak to our hearts those things that we need to know concerning your word and concerning your ways and concerning your statutes, concerning your covenants and your love and your goodness toward us. Surely, Lord, we are challenged today with things all around us, but we know that you are greater than, in us than he that it is in the world. So we need not uh, trouble ourselves on every side, but we have the opportunity to shine like light with the reflection of the character of Christ in us. Joy, peace, love, long suffering, self-control. We thank you for the great sacrifice that you've made toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We thank you for the giving of his body, the shedding of his blood, even separation from you, that we who was afar, was afar off could be bought now because we were Gentiles in the world, cut off from the promises of Israel with no hope. But, oh, God, you showed your compassion toward us, and we thank you and your mercy and your grace, because by grace we have been saved, not of our own. So we thank you for the resurrection of our Lord that assures us that we are not overlooked or shown favor but we have been justified. And we thank you again for he completed the work and took a seat by your right hand. Not that he was tired, but as he had mentioned, yelled from the cross, it is finished, done deal. We, we already belong to you and we are on our way to a place called heaven. But in the meantime, you have left us here to witness and to be the, again, salt and light in the world. So thank you for the privilege of sharing today with your brothers and sisters in Christ. So bless our time together. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Cause him to take those things that belong to you, reveal them to us, that we might live for you. For your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, today, today we're going to be sharing from, from the Word of God, still talking about uh, we will not be silent, that a book study by Edward Lutzer, Dr. Lutzer, and I want to share something with you uh, briefly, a, a testimony from uh, a gentleman, that, uh, a, a pastor that we all admire and listen to, Dr. David, David Jeremiah. He had something to say about this book, and I'm, it's rather lengthy. Uh, uh, maybe I can congest it down somewhat, but he had a lot to say about this book, and I mean, he, he covered it all, really. It took a little, it was a little lengthy for him to do it, but he, he came through on it. So let's, let's, I'll read, I'll read some of it for you, or maybe, maybe all of it. Then we'll get started on our PowerPoint presentation for today. Okay. All right, sharing with you from uh, Dr. David, David Jeremiah's uh, title, he says, uh, why you should read this book, talking about this book from uh, Edwin uh, Lutzer, Dr. Dr. Lutzer, who, who the title is, We Will Not Be Silenced. This is what uh, Dr. D David Meyer had to say. He said, recently, while sitting at the breakfast table, I told my wife that I felt like I was living through the dismantling of America. We talked about the horror of watching the news each night and seeing this country that we love being destroyed before our eyes. How could this ha be happening? What does it mean? Where is it all leading? What can we do? That's a good question. These are the cultural questions that are being asked in almost any setting you visit today. Unfortunately, almost no one has any of the answers. He, he goes on. But Erwin Lutzer, in We Will Not Be Silenced, is responding, and what he has written about what is happening is our nation is the most complete, the most honest, the most understandable explanations I have encountered. 
I agree to write this forward because I believe that you need to read this book, not just the first few pages, but every page, every paragraph, and every word. He goes on, he says, uh, it would, if I could, I would put, we will, be, we will not be silenced into every hand of every Christian in America, but it is already in your hands and I want to tell you why you should read it. This book examines every cultural issue we are facing. Nothing is left out. It addresses diversity issues, racial issues, gender issues, social justice issues and media issues, issues of few speech, free speech, issues of, of, of uh, rooted in socialism and Marxism. Most importantly, it covers issues related to the church and how it is responding to all this day. We will not be silenced, examines all the above and much more, but it doesn't just examine them, it explains them. Why these things, things, things are happening, how did we get to where we are without noticing where we are headed? Recently, we have watched as criminal mobs have ravaged our cities, burned down the buildings, and declared war on the police. What, what has been most troubling has been the attempt of these organizers, rioters, to, to tear down in moral and spiritual values as well. Why are they doing this? It is not just random civil disobedience. Nor, nor is it lawful protest gone awry. Erwin Luce explains that behind, that behind all this de destructive behavior is the de determination of the Marxists to destroy America's history to that it, so that it can be replaced by a new Marxist history that is being in, 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 in incurred into our children, children's mind from, from kindergarten through graduate school. They're not just tearing down monuments, they're, they're, they're trying to destroy the very foundations upon which our nation were founded. The understanding, he who controls the past controls the future. This book traces every secular culture expressions back to its roots. These things are not just happening, they have been orchestrated. They are not random individual occurrences. They are all part of a careful, scripted, and produced overtures to the destruction of America, finally. This book does not just examine what, I, what is happening and, and, and explain why it is happening. It, 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 it exhorts us to respond to what is happening. And that's, that's, and that's the point of, of my study and why I looked at the book. It exhorts us to do something. So he goes on to say, how do we live courageously in a culture where people who shout the loudest win the argument? How do we live during a time when Christianity is openly being remade to blend more com comfortably into a socialized culture? Here is Luce's hopeful answer for you, for me, and for all who can call upon the name of the Lord. I want to inspire us to have the co courage to walk toward the fire and not run away from the flames. God has brought us to this cultural moment and our future cannot be taken for granted. As has been said in a time of universal deception, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. <laughs> I agree with him on that. I want to encourage you to prayerfully and carefully read this book. Take good notes, highlight the key passages, write in the margins, and when you have finally wrapped your mind and heart around these truths, don't be Silent, Dr. David Jeremiah, pastor, Shadow Mountain Community Church. I thought that was a good, instead of starting off in one way, I thought I would start that way because several pastors have uh, written forwards to this book. I, I read one from Dr. T Tony Evans earlier. And so I thought I'd share that one with you. And I'll share some, some with you as, as we uh, go along today. And other, that, other times as we come together. Okay, let's, let's get started today on the review. Now, Cultural Marxism's growing shadows. How we got here is what uh, Dr. Lutz is speaking to us today. Well, we'll look at that. And I, I, I sought this particular uh, uh, challenge to us. I thought I thought we would repeat this again, something that we all already know. It is that a lie will never become the truth no matter how it is manipulated. I think we all can agree with that. Let, that's what, this is what, uh, 
Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said to the church at Rome, let, let God be true, but every man a liar. I'll slow up a little bit. I see some maybe taking those. I'll, uh, I'll slow up a little. Humanity. And, and it's this idea of humanity that grabs every soul, saved or unsaved. Or, and when I, when I looked at a, defin, a short definition of humanity, I, I came up with this answer. It says, of, of being mocked or motivated by concerns for this alleviation of suffering. Being concerned about the allevi alleviation of suffering. And that's what most groups are, of sort of active, what they call active groups. They are seeking to uh, do something seem like, it, seem like it's good. And for the most part, part of it is good. But you and I know it, it, the whole has to be good in order to be accepted by the Lord, not just partial. And so those are the kinds of things that we want to be examining. And by the way, Paula, if, if there's someone who wants to make a comment, as we go along, and that's my, I always pop, do that. You just let them, let them know that they can raise their hand to you. You let them know, and they can come in and have, we can we can dialogue, because uh, this is a this is a, a kind of a different kind of a study that we've we've done before. I've done them before. But this is a little bit challenging. It's up to date. It's right where we live every day, and I thought it would be uh, an, an, an inspiration and encouraging, as we use the Word of God, though. The word of God is always our foundation, not the book. But can I be clear on that? The book is not the foundation, is not inspired. The Bible, the word of God is inspired. That's where we rely on. We rely on the word of God. And then we, 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 then we view all, the, all that is being said through the prism of the Holy Spirit, line it up with the, with the word of God, line on line, precept on precept. If it does not line up, we, we, we point it out. If we study it, and if you see something you want to share, you go right ahead and feel free to do so. This is what Lucifer said. He said, incredible as it may seem, Karl Marx still rules from the grave. Well, Jesus was the only one who ruled from the grave. <laughs> he says, uh, incredible as it may seem, I'm quoting him, Karl Marx still rules from the grave. It's an incredible, incredible kind of uh, thought. He talks about a cultural Marxism growing shadow. That's what he's talking. That's what he's talking about. Now I think my screen may be a little different from yours because I, I have to move around your, your the views. I can view some of you, just a few, just a few of you, so that you'll understand. There's a delay sometimes. Maybe I haven't gotten this thing down like I ought to. But the point is, I have to move, shift my view of you, the few that I do see around, so I can read my, my PowerPoint. I know it's got to be a better way. Paul has just haven't given me that that those instructions yet. <laughs> But anyway, cultural Marxism is what we're going to be talking about mainly this evening, this afternoon, in its shadows. The growing shadow, the growing shadow political of correctness, the growing shadow political correctness. That's what that's what we're talking about here. The growing shadow. Has anybody ever defined to you what political correctness means? So I, I, I sought to go out, search up some, some uh scriptures and, not, and and see how what the Lord says to say about it. But it ain't no such thing in the Bible. So I, I saw what to the world. And this is what I came up with. Political correctness, the avoidance often considered as taken to extremes of, or forms of expressions or actions that are perceived, underlined, perceived to include marginalized or insult groups of people who are socially disadvantaged or discriminated against. That's the dictionary definition of political correctness. And if you are, are inclined to write that down, it's quite a bit of a, an answer, uh, but surely I'll zero in on the word I have underlined. It's what you perceive, what you perceive to be exclus exclusionary or marginalized or insult a group or people. Doesn't say who, I guess there's anyone in the culture who perceived that way, you can come to the conclusion that the people are, there's something uh, missed or, or going on. And I, I, I'll never forget uh, when I was uh, about to uh, retire from the state and uh, they had uh, some training for administrators, which I've been on a few, I love to go on different states and all, but this time, I wasn't interested in going because I was getting ready to tie. 
But the issue was, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to make an illustration here. The issue was uh, discrimination. Really, it was, it was, uh, it was a little, it, we had already dealt with discrimination over a period of time. And was, they had an annotated code for that. Maryland has a code for that. But this, this other one had to do with, uh, uh, had to do with, uh, I think the call escaped my mind, had to do with females and their uh, harassment. That's what it was, sexual harassment. Sexual harassment was being introduced to the state of Maryland and being taught to the administrators so they know what to do and how to do it and how to address it. Because it, it was time sensitive. If you were a, a manager or a system manager or a, a supervisor, you had these time sensitive documents that you had to deal with concerning uh, discrimination or sexual harassment. But as I was sitting there in the meeting, in the initial meeting, we had someone from the uh, uh, Department of Mental Health and Hygiene, they was teaching, teaching the subject. When he got to the point where it says that uh, if, she, if, the, if the female believes that she was being harassed, so far, everything was going on pretty good. And like I said, I wasn't going to say anything because I, I was getting ready to retire. I wasn't too much in, into what he was talking about. But then I thought about it. I say, did he say if the, if the female perceived that she was being harassed, that I would have to answer a certain, if she put in five grievances, I had to answer all of them in a certain period of time? It seemed impossible. So I raised my hand. It wasn't about, no, people weren't asking questions. So I raised my hand. I said, sir, did you read, did I understand you to say it correctly? that if the female perceived that uh, she's being harassed, then I had to respond. He said, yes, that's correct. I said, suppose that her perception is off or wrong. I say, or she say something, make a charge against a person and it's not true. What happened? He said, well, that's not covered. I said, what do you mean it's not covered? I say, listen, has been my experience on this discrimination issue is this. I've sat on many boards where <laughs> We, we, we would go from the first top top five people on the board was going to be promoted. Now, for the most part, two or three of them, if they don't get promotion, they're going to file some kind of grievance, right? <laughs> now you're going to add a female to it. If you don't, if the person don't get, don't get promoted, all you do is perceive that you were discriminated. She was discriminated against because of her gender. I say, who came up with this? I, I, it kind of blurred out. You know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not sociable in some situations. You know, I just. I just blurted it out. I said, who in the world came up with this idea? This is crazy. I may have said that you know, while I was going my way out of the room. I, I mean, I, I said, this is impossible. How can I do my job, go down to all them hearings that I'm already going to, and they're going to add another one to it. I was glad to get out of there, to tell you the truth. So I pray for all the state workers and all of all y'all who have these kinds of jobs. They're difficult. Uh, what I'm doing is marking time so you can take down that uh, take down. That actually happened. Take down the uh, definition for politically correctness. Somebody else have one and you can share it with us. Uh, I, I, that's about the best I can. Now, we talked about the cultural Marxist growing shadow, right? See, there's a shadow. You can see it's, it's, this is distorted. You know, these, that's distorted. You know, it's distorted. That's, that might be, incredible, but this is a distortion point. Okay, so let's look, let's see how this works out. Uh, and I came up with the gaining shape of political correctness. In other words, it started out as a shadow, but it's going to take shape and form into something concrete that's going to still be elusive, but it's challenging. The curbing of free speech, that is one of the first, one of the first things that, that, that has happened in our culture. And I like the way our uh, what uh, uh, Lutzer, he tries to give us an explanation about this thing. Let me look at some of the words that he has to say. He says, uh, a powerful cultural stream has fed this river of political correctness. The curbing of free speech, increased government control, growing racial conflict and hostility toward Christianity, leading these attacks against the traditional American values is, from, is a form of Marxism that is widely taught in many universities. And that's what I was trying to get to. Widely taught in many universities and assumed by the elite, elitists as the theory that best explains the iniquities of our society and our best hopes for curbing them. In other words, this issue has been taught in our universities for over a period of years while we were asleep. <laughs> These issues were being taught. And most of us who've been to college, I've been to graduate school, some of you have too. But uh, and you get into some of these discussions with these individuals, but uh, 
the whole point I'm trying to make is, how did we get here? Remember, remember this, this particular top topic that we're talking about today too as a subtopic is how did we get here? We got here because believers, and not believers, I'm talking about Christians, not world, the world, we know the world acts a certain way. Believers have sat in these classes and have been to these universities and they've been quiet and silenced by the majority who yell their loudest as, as, as uh, Dr. Jeremiah says and get all the attention. And so things have just rolled along. But uh, we're going to see what happens when you do that as a consequence, as a, as a payday for this kind of thing. Minister, so Carpenter. Yes. Minister Carpenter. Yes. What Could you explain uh, Marxism? Yeah, I think I, think I have a, 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 a definition on the screen. It's going to come up. I believe it is. Let's see. Matter of fact, I have a whole tape, tape on that, Sister Deborah. In a few seconds, you're going to, I'm, I'm going to give you a, a whole dissertation on it, plus a plus a, a whole concept of what Marxism is all about. Thank you for asking that question. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Keep okay. them coming. <laughs> Increase. So we so we says the gaining of this this whole idea of Marxism as it comes in, into shape political correctness. Talk about well, political correctness. The curbing of free speech. Increasing government control. Keep keep in mind. Keep keep in mind. And listen, when I when I play the uh, DVD, I want you to uh, take some notes if you can, because you're going to see how all these things come together and integrate into. And my particular uh, belief is that it's all aimed at destroying uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1, I believe it is 1 through maybe 5. It talks about the order that God has set up. I think that's, that, that's, that's its aim. This is the surface stuff that we're just dealing with. Rolling racial conflict. These, these are things that are taking shape in our community and in our churches, by the way. Hostile toward Christianity. Uh -huh, that's where they're headed. This is, this is all playing out. As, as our Dr. Uh, Jeremiah said, it's organizing this plan. It's not just happenstance. Marxism is, is a theory, of course, a, and this is a theory. This is a theory, Deborah. This is part of the theory, but this is not all of it. This is just a little, little, little introduction because I, I have some information for him to share. Marxism, well, Marx, Marx, Karl Marx introduced a theory of a state of supremacy that necessitate economic, social controls that were imposed in Russia after the Revolutionary War of 1912. You say, what does that got to do with me? Yeah. You say, I don't, even, I don't even know how, why this is even brought up in a Bible study. You'll see, because, let me read something to you. The ch Russian church was the social cement of the autocratic, of autocrats in Russia. Let me say it again. The Russian church was the social cement of the autocratic or, or uh, autocrats in Russia. In other words, the church had developed into a cultural situation. And, the, and then the government was using the church to abuse and, and, and its people. That's what was going to see. And when you think of Russia, you think of Russia as being like a godless nation because of their, uh, uh, they have ultimately removed God from all of their documents, their official documents, and, and, and pers persecuted the church. The, church has to, the true church has to go on the ground as people in prison being martyred and all right now because of the name of Jesus. But Russia wasn't always that way. But what, what we can, we'll see, Marx, Karl Marx, he had it all planned, uh, he had it all condensed in a, in a book and some other things too. He wasn't the only one. But the whole point is if, 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 if a nation allow the, the atheists and the unsaved to influence the culture more than the church, then this is the result of what happened in Russia. But uh, just stay with me. Just stay with me. Don't leave. Stay with, pray for me and stay with me. The Russian church was experiencing no conflict and splits within it the, within the prior to 1917. Now, I got, you say, well, I'm, and I'm qualifying my, my information that I'm sharing with you. I'm not just sharing it off the top of my head. I got this from Facebook. It's, Facebook has a, what they call a history learning site. You can go in there and research it out yourself. After this revolution, during, during which millions of people were killed, and this is a very important, I'm going to spend some time on this. After this revolution, during, during which, after what revolution? The revolution of 1912. After, the, after this revolution, during which millions of people were killed, the state abolished private property and set out to bring equality and justice 
to an oppressed people. That, that's what they was doing, they said. Okay, now, if you uh, have read or heard anything about Marxism, they, they always uh, indicate that there are gonna be some uh, casualties. It's impossible for Marxism to uh, come into a culture and establish itself without casualties. And they allow for that. He, he'll allow for that. He said, oh yeah, some people are gonna be hurt and some people are gonna be killed, but in the end, the culture will be better. Because first of all, they don't acknowledge God at all or any of it. And so that's, that's the whole idea is to, religion is one of the main points that they try to stress that. If you got religion, you gonna have conflict. So they say, you gotta get rid of that first or one of the, it's gotta be in your priorities before you can establish it. But anyway, I'm, I'm gonna let the, the experts talk to you a little bit about that as I get to my presentation. Now, before Marx, Karl Marx and some others came on, Nagel and some others came on the scene, Russia was a sovereign socialist state within a federal structure. In other words, they had another organization, a governmental organization opposed to uh, 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 the, the, the organization that they evolved into after they after the church, they, they moved the church off the scene. That's what I'm trying to show you. Marxism from theory, from the theory, from theory to reality. From theory to reality. Karl Marx political theory. And I'm going to go to, I'm going to make an attempt, uh, Sister Paula, to pull up uh, this, this, this DVD, which I've been spending time on trying to do it. And I'm going to challenge each. I want I want everyone to have at least a question or two from the from the uh, from the presentation. Please, please. I want I want each each person to have at least one question. Or can you see where we are with this when you when you listen to this? Most people agree that we need to improve our economic system somehow. Yet we're also often keen to dismiss the ideas of capitalism's most famous and ambitious critic, Karl Marx. This isn't very surprising. In practice, his political and economic ideas have been used to design disastrously planned economies and nasty dictatorships. Nevertheless, we shouldn't reject Marx too quickly. We ought to see him as a guide whose diagnosis of capitalism's ills helps us to navigate towards a more promising future. Capitalism is going to have to be reformed, and Marx's analyses are going to be part of any answer. Marx was born in 1818 in Trier in Germany. Soon he became involved with the Communist Party, a tiny group of intellectuals advocating for the overthrow of the class system and the abolition of private property. He worked as a journalist and had to flee Germany, eventually settling in London. Marx wrote an enormous number of books and articles, sometimes with his friend Friedrich Engels. Mostly, Marx wrote about capitalism, the type of economy that dominates the Western world. It was, in his day, still getting going, and Marx was one of its most intelligent and perceptive critics. These were some of the problems he identified with it. Modern work is alienated. One of Marx's greatest insights is that work can be one of the sources of our greatest joys. But in order to be fulfilled at work, Marx wrote that workers need to see themselves in the objects they have created. Think of the person who built this chair. It's straightforward, strong, honest, and elegant. It's an example of how, at its best, labor offers us a chance to externalize what's good inside us. But this is increasingly rare in the modern world. Part of the problem is that modern work is incredibly specialized. Specialized jobs make the modern economy highly efficient, but they also mean that it's seldom possible for any one worker to derive a sense of the genuine contribution they might be making to the real needs of humanity. Marx argued that modern work leads to alienation, entfremdung. In other words, a feeling of disconnection between what you do all day and who you feel you really are and what you think you'd ideally be able to contribute to existence. Modern work is insecure. Capitalism makes the human being utterly expendable, just one factor among others in the forces of production, and one that can ruthlessly be let go the minute the costs rise or savings can be made through technology. And yet, as Marx knew deep inside each of us, we don't want to be arbitrarily let go. We're terrified of being abandoned. Communism isn't just an economic theory. Understood emotionally, it expresses a deep-seated longing that we always have a place in the world's heart, that we will not be cast out. Workers get paid little while capitalists get rich. This is perhaps the most obvious qualm that Marx had with capitalism. 
In particular, he believed that capitalists shrink the wages of the laborers as much as possible in order to skim off a wide profit margin. He called this primitive accumulation, ursprüngliche Akkumulation. Whereas capitalists see profit as a reward for ingenuity and technological talent, Marx was far more damning. Profit is simply theft, and what you're stealing is the talent and hard work of your workforce. However much one dresses up the fundamentals, Marx insists that at its crudest, capitalism means paying a worker one price for doing something and then selling it to somebody else at a much higher price. Profit is the fancy term for exploitation. Capitalism is very unstable. Marx proposed that capitalist systems are characterized by a series of crises. Every crisis is dressed up by capitalists as being somehow freakish and rare and soon to be the last one. Far from it, argued Marx. Crises are endemic to capitalism, and they're caused by something rather odd. The fact that we're able to produce too much, far more than anyone needs to consume. Capitalist crises are crises of abundance, rather than, as in the past, crises of shortage. Our factories and systems are so efficient, we could give everyone on this planet a car, a house, access to a decent school and a hospital. And that's what so enraged Marx, but also made him so hopeful too. Few of us actually need to work because the modern economy is so productive. But rather than seeing this need not to work as the freedom it is, we complain about it masochistically and describe it by a pejorative word, unemployment. We should call it freedom. There's so much unemployment for a good and deeply admirable reason, because we're so good at making things efficiently. We're not all needed at the coalface. But in that case, we should, thought Marx, make leisure admirable. We should redistribute the wealth of the massive corporations that make so much surplus money and give it to everyone. This is, in its own way, as beautiful a dream as Jesus's promise of heaven, but a good deal more realistic sounding. Capitalism is bad for capitalists. Marx didn't think that capitalists were evil. For example, he was acutely aware of the sorrows and secret agonies that lay behind bourgeois marriage. Marx argued that marriage was actually an extension of business and that the bourgeois family was fraught with tension, oppression and resentment, with people staying together not for love, but for financial reasons. Marx believed that the capitalist system forces everyone to put economic interests at the heart of their lives, so that they can no longer know deep, honest relationships. He called this psychological tendency commodity fetishism, Waren fetishismus, because it makes us value things that have no objective value. He wanted people to be freed from financial constraint so that they could at last start to make sensible, healthy choices in their relationships. The 20th century feminist answer to the oppression of women has been to argue that women should simply be able to go out to work. But Marx's answer was more subtle. This feminist insistence merely perpetuates human slavery. The point isn't that women should imitate the sufferings of their male colleagues. It's that men and women should have the permanent option to enjoy leisure. Why don't we all think a bit more like Marx? An important aspect of Marx's work is that he proposes that there's an insidious, subtle way in which the economic system colors the sort of ideas that we end up having. The economy generates what Marx termed an ideology. A capitalist society is one where most people, rich and poor, believe all sorts of things that are really just value judgments that relate back to the economic system. For example, that a person who doesn't work is worthless, that leisure beyond a few weeks a year is sinful, that more belongings will make us happier, and that worthwhile things and people will invariably make money. In short, one of the biggest evils of capitalism is not that there are corrupt people at the top. This is true in any human hierarchy but that capitalist ideas teach all of us to be anxious, competitive, conformist, and politically complacent. Marx didn't only outline what was wrong with capitalism. We also get glimpses of what Marx wanted the ideal utopian future to be like. In his Communist Manifesto, he describes a world without private property or inherited wealth, with a steeply graduated income tax, centralized control of the banking, communication, and transport industries, and free public education. Marx also expected that communist society would allow people to develop lots of different sides of their natures. In communist society, it's possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow, to hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, just as I have a mind without ever becoming hunter, fisherman, herdsman, or critic. 
After Marx moved to London, he was supported by his friend and intellectual partner Friedrich Engels, a wealthy man whose father owned a cotton plant in Manchester. Engels covered Marx's debts and made sure his works were published. Capitalism paid for communism. The two men even wrote each other adoring poetry. Marx was not a well-regarded or popular intellectual in his day. Respectable, conventional people of Marx's day would have laughed at the idea that his ideas could remake the world. Yet, just a few decades later, they did. His writings became the keystone for some of the most important ideological movements of the 20th century. But Marx was like a brilliant doctor in the early days of medicine. He could recognize the nature of the disease, although he had no idea how to go about curing it. At this point in history, we should all be Marxists in the sense of agreeing with his diagnosis of our troubles. But we need to go out and find the cures that really will work. As Marx himself declared, and we deeply agree, philosophers until now have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. Mr. Carpenter, back in the 1800s, um, Karl Marx already talked about technology and uh, mass production and those types of things that we saw, um, that we see today. Yeah, but what 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 we I was I was I was uh, my aim was to. Uh, get to some of the key points that uh, that, is, that is actually affecting us today. Right. Things like, uh, and, and I don't know, maybe we'll have a bit of a time. Uh, we will uh, have a chance to discuss some of them from a biblical perspective, but it's things like uh, like uh, uh, work. You know, he talks about giving money to everyone. Remember, he's distribution, and he talks about how work is really evil in a certain sense. People mm -hmm. should, you know, shouldn't have to make a person feel bad because they don't work. So they said that's not even. Uh, so th those are the kinds of things. And so today, what do we have? We have a government that's giving up trillions of dollars as we speak right at this moment. They got more coming. You don't have to worry about it. They said, and, and remember Mark talked about education should be free. There's a lot of free stuff. He deals with a lot of free stuff. And so, so you can see, but Russia went down the same road before. But this is what is the point? The point is. The, the Russia went down the same road before that we we're going down at, this, at, the, at the present time. And I, I have some principles on it. I can only get back to my slide, okay, to show this is what, this is what I wanted to get to. Yeah. Okay. Minister Carpenter. Yes. Uh, uh, real quick, can I make a quick comment? Yeah, go right ahead. Okay. Uh, I, I was standing in line at Giant today and I came across this book called The Most Significant Teachings in the Bible. And as I was thumbing through it, wouldn't you know it, I came upon a uh, page that said, uh, uh, work is God's gift and principles of work from the biblical perspective. And I'll just take, it'll take me about 30 seconds. Right. Uh, anybody wants the scriptures and information, let me know, I'll, I'll send it to you. But first of all, that God ordained work, Genesis 2.15, that God creates us with skills and talents to do his work. Uh, Exodus 31, 1 to 5. We saw that in the building of the tabernacle, Pastor taught as we're going through Exodus. To work as if to work as if we are serving the Lord, Colossians 3, 22, 24, to imitate the work habits of an ant, Proverbs 6, 6 to 8, to work to the best of our ability, Ecclesiastes 9, 10, that if we will not work, we shouldn't eat. Right. Uh, Thessalonians 3, 10 and to faithfully manage the work we're given, Matthew 25, 26 to 29. Uh, work would be fulfilling, Ecclesiastes 2, 24, and to be enjoyed, Ecclesiastes 3, 22. So we can see that what Marx was saying about work and what God's word says about work are two different animals uh, altogether. Two, two opposites. Yes. And in fact, yes. Adam was working before the fall. Adam was at work. That's right, tending the garden. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, send that out to me. All right, I'll, I'll, what I'll do is send it to Paul Thank and you. get it out to everybody, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you, was, thank you. That was a timely thing there. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was standing in the line of giant and I just pulled the book mm -hmm. down and opened it up and there it was. Yeah. yeah. You could, the only explanation for that is the Holy Spirit. There's no you other providential, You got that? Providential hand. Yeah, yeah. I'll, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll get that to Paul and she can get it to you, okay? Uh -huh. Thank you. 
Uh, now here, here we go, the deception of cultural Marxism. Uh, what, now, I don't know if we have answered Deborah's question about what, what, is, my, my, what is the definition of Marxism. It really is a, a philosophy. Uh, there it is. A theory, it's, a theory, it's a theory of a state of supremacy that, necessi that necess <laughs> necessitate uh, economic and social controls that are imposed in Russia. So it really is it's a, it's a theory of state supremacy of control that people are, normally would be better off controlling in a, a kind of like in a I won't use the term cult, but in a, in a communist, a commune kind of setting, opposed to individuality. What mm -hmm. was Deborah? I, I don't, I don't see it. See, I, don't see it. I can't see. It. Mm -hmm. I, 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 are you there, Deborah? Yes, yeah, she's there. Do, do, do you, you, you want to come? Yes, I'm here. Did, did you get? An, did you get an understanding about? Yes, I did. It's, it's, it's all about. It's all about the group opposed to. Yeah. The, the individual theory now, just in theory alone. There's no place in the world where this ever worked out, you understand, because people at the top tend to be at the top and, and they will find a way. Ask those oligarchs in Russia yeah. if, 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 if uh, they, they, they hate capitalism, you know. Mm -hmm. So, Minister Carpenter, yeah. could you repeat that definition again? And I did want, want to um, emphasize that it is just a theory. Yes. It's yes. not anything that has ever worked out. Yes. But could you give me that um, explanation again? Theory of state supremacy, it, it, et cetera, et cetera. Necessitate, it, that necessitated economic and social controls. Okay. Okay, I got it. They got to be, otherwise, got to have a central group that control control everything, going to make sure that everybody gets what is equally and just, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Hi, I'm, I'm just listening to um, the video and, and how he was talking about distribution of wealth. And um, he never did say where it should come from, but I'm assuming it will come from the elites or the government. Um, it's sort of like with the model that we're hearing now from our government and elites, you know, about us, uh, 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 income, a universal income and free this, free that. It seemed like that model is there even when you think about Black Lives Matters who are uh, Marxist. That's the model that they seem like they're trying to push, you know, yes. in the United States. So you can see where it's playing out now and a lot of people are buying into it because as we know, nothing is free to follow price. So, you know, it seemed like, you know, you're transferring your autonomy to give it to um, a government or an elite to make decisions for you and in turn, for them giving you money and what happened. Yeah. This is this, the system is being tried throughout various countries, various governments yeah. in the United States now. Very small ent entities are trying. I think uh, of all places, the place out in California, uh, what was it? Uh, they, they tried it and they will give everybody was guaranteed uh, uh, X amount of dollars per week. I think one of the congressmen, the most famous one of the, of the what you call them, the group or whatever they call them, she's advocating that everybody in America should get a, get, should get a certain yeah. The quad, I think yeah. that's what they're pushing. The, the quad yeah. or, or the squad, or one of the two. Yeah, the squad, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the more you give up, you know, to, you want to lose control and you have elites right now buying our property and, you know, saying, you know, you won't own anything and you'll be happy. So, you yeah, know, that's what they can, say. <laughs> you can see that it's coming, you know, to this country and there's a <sighs> lot of people who are thinking it's such a great idea and not knowing that. It is. It's not biblical, and it's just it's, well, it's, it's just the evil concept, in my opinion. Right. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. But um, and to add to what Sister Pat just said, um, financial experts here have said, like with this free quote unquote, because it's not free. The money that they're given, they have said, well, what you should do is not spend it. Anytime financial experts are telling you to not spend the money, put it in an interest bearing account because it will come back later and bite you. But no one's listened to that. They just see, oh, it's free money, it's free money. They're, but they're not even doing good things with it. So people aren't yeah. really thinking about nothing in, nothing in world is free. Wasn't it an old song when those people said it? <laughs> yeah. nothing, in, nothing in life is free. That's right. Right. And, and, and by the way, I heard on radio, and this, is, this don't have to be true, but they say that the child care thing, that every, everybody's receiving the money, they say at the end of the year, you got to, if you got to uh, tabulate your income, 
Mm-hmm. Versus, yeah. then you got to pay your taxes on it. <laughs> so what happens is they're going to, so if you normally do child care for $3,000 and they give it to you now every month, at the end of the year, that becomes your income. Yes. And, and, it'll be tacked on to the end of whatever you made that year. And then, right, you'll be mm-hmm. taxed or put in another tax bracket. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. That's what I heard. I was, I, was, I was amazed when I heard that. Because I thought it was free, too. Wasn't free, like you said. Mm-hmm. But now, here's the real one that's from, biblical, from a biblical perspective that's behind it. We know that we are of God. That's why we're discussing this. And the whole world is under what? The sway of the wicked one. The sway of the wicked one. That's where they are. That's exactly what the issue is. And his issue, what he's seeking to do is, to, is, to, is attack the, the word of God and the people of God. And that's his whole goal. Now, the deception, the deceptive influence of cultural Marxism today, according to Dr. Luther. Now, he's going to tie it all into what had happened in the past of how it's affecting us today, personally. Cultural warriors do not seek to impose their desires to control people on their physical battlefields. There's no physical battlefield. But that's what makes it most deceptive. And I think we have been asleep since the 50s, I guess, or maybe the 40s. And here we are now with uh, uh, in the situation the way it is now, uh, where uh, there's no res- respect or response to uh, the church itself. Uh, the church is almost being sidelined for whatever reasons and they're split and it, remember i said in russia this happened in russia where they, they was, had a big split in the denomination they really was out of order anyway by that time they had turned into a they had turned the church into a bureaucracy opposed almost like england opposed to uh independent churches and that, and even today the, the russia has churches but they were in by the government Cultural warriors wins the hearts of the minds of the people, what incrementally and gradually transform the culture. That's what's going on. You want to know the crux of our our teaching today? That's what it's all about. Cultural warriors wins the hearts and minds of the people incrementally and gradually transform the culture. It's been going on since, uh, well, since I've been in the world, really, and it has accelerated itself from my perspective. Why? because the people of God has gotten away from the word of God. The word of God is not no longer received or, and even, even many uh, who are professing Christians, and we do uh, uh, seek to teach our children, you know, the, the word and that sort of thing. But it seems like as soon as they go to the university, they, lose, they, they, they forget or either forget or they never did receive it from the beginning. I don't know, I can't be, I don't judge the motives of people. I can only look at that conduct, as McGee say. He can, he, can, he can always check out a vine and see if it's got fruit on it. You can do that. You can't judge a man's motives. You don't know or a woman's motives. You don't know what their motives are. And they're sinful to try to do that. All I can say, though, is this. I know we had uh, Billy Graham and we had many preachers, evangelists, that was preaching the gospel all over the country and all over the world. People were just coming in droves, coming to Christ. But I don't know what happened to them. I don't know what happened to them. You know, that's, that's all I'm saying. I don't know what happened. Uh, but uh, we'll move on unless, unless you have some, some other comments or observations. They don't, they, they don't, what they have done is bombarded with exaggerations. Look, this, this is what we've been talking about. This is some of what we've been talking about. They have bombarded, we have been bombarded with exaggerations of, and delusionary promises. People, no, what, look, people accept it because they want to. People want to believe that, you know, they can get a check every month and don't have to work, work and do anything. But I mean, who don't want to believe that? I mean, I don't, but I know it's not because it's a lie. But the point is, we it's something, they appeal to our desires and our old nature. That's what they do. But it, it's work, it, worked in, it worked in Russia. It worked in China. The China, is a, China, they are the largest people groups in the country, in the world. I mean, in the country, in the world. It worked, it worked with them it worked with, because if there's a deprivation of material things such as food, shelter, water, the things, the primary things that we need to survive on in the physical realm, but what we really need is a spiritual food and spiritual instructions to learn how to live. Survival and living is two different uh, principles. We can survive in the world. Of course, we know 666 will come along uh, and we know we're heading that way. 
we see that COVID is on the scene and you gotta have, you gotta have a shot. You know, if, you, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna go this place, you gotta have a shot. This is kind of a preparation for being obedient to getting 666, the number. Otherwise you won't be able to uh, buy anything, won't be able to drink it, you know, you don't have anything unless you take the mark of the beast. It's another issue altogether. I mean, get too deep into that. But the point is this, when people are bombarded with exaggerated and, Ill and illusionary promises, people accept it at, because they want to, they want those things. I am amazed at the naming and claiming of uh, churches who people have been going there for but 15 years, but they still think this Sunday is gonna be their Sunday. You understand what I'm saying? That they're gonna get their, 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 their miracle and they're gonna get their car and they're gonna get their reward and they're gonna get, but they've been going there for I don't know how long and, and things haven't changed. You would think by now they would have understood, came to an understanding that, you know what? I don't think this thing is really working out the way he said it is. But the last time I saw him briefly Sunday night, he had a great big crowd. I mean, I mean, you couldn't hardly know him. He had his Bible up talking about this is his word and they, always, they were all there. So what am I saying? This is something that we want to believe. And, and that's what I alluded to earlier, uh, when we, a week or so ago, we were talking about the emotions of the moment. When we emotionally want to believe something and we set our mind on that thing, whether it's true, whether it's a truth or untrue, it becomes a reality to us if we hold on to it for a period of time. And how do you do that? You got, you got to keep right on thinking about it. Keep on. That's what James 1, 14, 15, I guess most of you know that's my favorite scripture, you know, in, in general, especially when I'm teaching. James 1, 1, 14 and 1, 15. If you keep on thinking about something, ultimately, if you put it in your mind and it might set your mind on it, next thing you know, you're seeking toward it. Then your des desire builds up. It builds up. And after a period of time, of course, you can see yourself with it. Then after a while, you uh, succumb to it. And now it controls you basically at what happened in many cases. So the people who think, who thinking, you know, that uh, gasoline is uh, automobiles will be out of style because they pollute the sky. We are, you and I know that the sky, the, 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 the world is being polluted because the world is cursed. Romans chapter eight tells us that. The world is cursed. Instead of when God, God judged Adam, he did not curse Adam. He cursed the earth. He cursed the earth. So if he cursed the earth, then the earth is gradually wearing out like an old garment, the Bible says. That's what's going on. Now, can, can man in his, in his uh, reckless uh, decision-making pollute the air and kill everybody in the city? Yes, he can. But he ain't going to destroy the whole world. God has that under control. He is sovereign over everything. But yes, to, and we can't deny that there is some type of a, a global uh, 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 situation going on, decline. It is but it has, has very little to do with uh, the, the, the effort of man to stop it. That's what I'm trying to say. But he, he, can, he, can, be, he can be more uh, of a good steward because God has, God has given us stewardship. He gave Adam a stewardship of the earth. It, the, the devil through a lie, lie and deception took Adam's stewardship away from him. And, and now he's, in the child, he's, he's the steward, but he's not the owner. Adam was never the owner. God has always been the owner. God has always been in control. And so even though, in, though you say see, he's under the sway or influence of the culture, but he is still not God. But God gives us a choice to follow his word. And then you and I cannot do that apart from being led by the Holy Spirit. That's the whole point. But we have an old nature. That old nature still wants to believe certain things. And if told to it, in the way the news media, it's interesting. I, I thought about this. Have you ever saw a commercial on television? It has large writings, big pictures, and all thing. It has underneath there, it has a look, some writing that you can't even see. When you when you're watching a commercial on television, I'm just trying to challenge you on on how what you what you want to believe when you want to believe something. They give you all these things. Okay, they're gonna sell you this medicine or tell you to go tell, seek the doctor, have him write your prescription so you can make money. They tell you all the things that it, all the adverse effects that it that it has. That's one thing. But or just about that's just in medicine, but just automobiles, anything that they sell you in large quantities. You look, there's a small writing underneath that. Who would be willing to buy something from someone if I if I came to you and try to upright sell you something and then uh, had and told you that, and, and tried to explain it to you and have it in a small area where you couldn't see it, but I, then I, I have the other advertisement so that uh, you you would be willing to 
want to, that's what I'm trying to get to, want to receive or purchase what I'm selling you. But that's the, that's the system. Have you ever thought about that? All those, all those commercials, but for the most part, has something, a small writing on the Bible, which you cannot read. Don't tell me you can read. You cannot read it. Go right out to the store and buy it and don't even pay no attention to it. Why? That's the question. Why am I using this as an illustration? Because we want to believe. And when we want to believe it, we will ultimately accept it. That's what I'm trying to say. I think I made a point on that. People welcome it because they are convinced of its benefits. That, so so let's, let's, let's sum this thing up, okay? Now, let's go, let's go from a point by point as we sum up and finish. The deceptive influence of culture Marxism today is according to Dr. Edwin Lucid, the culture warriors do not seek to Im impose their will to, on you or to control you outright to your face on a physical battlefield. Although they've gotten bolder down in Seattle, uh, uh, but uh, they still uh, 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 somewhat restrained. Although they have their own little area, city area down there, they, they control them. Now, culture warriors win. How do they win? They win your heart, they win your mind, and they do it incrementally. Okay, then gradually they transform the culture. Okay, then they bombard you with exaggerated and, and, and illusionary premise, promises. You, 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 you want to believe it, you want to accept it. And then what happens? Ultimately, you see yourself as benefiting from it, and then you are less likely to resist it. And therein is the enemies, James 1, 14 and 15 in operation in our lives. And so I think we're going to uh, stop at, at, at this moment. Amen. Let us be this myth. And let's all be this myth. And may the love of God, our heavenly Father, the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide until we set time, you gather us together again, Lord. Keep us as we depart from one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.